lesson starting this is going to be an ic on common neuro ophthalmology complaints in children and we are first going to be starting with dr siddharth kesarwani dr siddharth is an Thank alumni you. of lv prasad eye institute and he is a private practitioner now in bombay at his clinic jnr eye and squint clinic and he's going to be talking to us about how to evaluate a child um, who apparently cannot see yeah, good morning everybody. Thanks Varshni uh, for that introduction and inclusion in this IC. And uh, welcome to our uh, instruction course. So I'll be speaking about evaluation of a screaming toddler. Now evaluation of a screaming toddler is itself a difficult task. And to get out clues from the neuro-ophthalmological point of view is even more demanding. But let us just go through the basics of examining a child who is not cooperative. So what is the common presentation? Not, it's not uncommon in a pediatric clinic to have a toddler between two to four years of age who is terrified of the doctor. He may have some behavioral issues also or he may just be a normal kid who has got stranger anxiety. And he may have been sent for a routine examination or he may be suspected of having a problem. So this is the common presentation of a toddler. And on top of that, if he is not cooperative, then that becomes a problem. Let us, this is a small clip of a uncooperative child, a typical uncooperative child. He doesn't have any neurological issues, but he's just shit set terrified of the uh, doctor. So his examination actually took six minutes, but I have compressed it into one and a half minutes. You can see uh, 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 that the child is extremely uncomfortable when he comes. And then you don't do, you don't jump into the examination right away. You give him some time, you know, and then gradually he tries to relax a little bit when his threat perception is lowered. And then gradually you can do an external examination, you can do a retinoscopy. All the time he's on the verge of breaking down, but still somehow you try to uh, complete the task slowly and steadily, one thing at a time. <coughs> you may not be able to follow the whole sequential thing of, you know, whatever you do in an adult examination where you take vision and then you do external examination, then you do refraction, then you dilate, then you do fundus. Here, whatever is allowing you to do, you do that. So there is no particular sequence of examining a toddler. It's just that keep your eyes open from the moment he comes in and then go about your business of trying to find as much information as possible. Because your first response when you see a child who is crying is, Child is uncooperative, scheduled for EU. Now, if that kind of a, a thing is there, then it becomes, you are not going to see what, what is there. So some information is always better than no information. And it doesn't matter how uncooperative the child is, just by cajoling him, by showing him things which are new. So you should always have a bunch of toys which are, you know, whenever you go abroad or something, buy, pick up some toys which are not easily available in the, our country so that child doesn't have exposure to them. So whenever they see that is a novelty value. So it grabs their attention for a few seconds and you know that is enough for you to pick up the signs. So first is the attitude. The attitude should be yes, this child is uncooperative, fine. But let me try and see what I can do about it. If you see, okay, this is uncooperative and that's it. Then end of examination, refer to pediatric ophthalmologist or schedule for EUA, you're going to miss a lot of things. It just requires a different approach. The approach is that you cannot put it in the conveyor belt thing, you know, where the whole sheet gets filled up one after the other. There are going to be missing gaps, but we'll come to that later. But whatever you can pick up, you pick up. So you break it down into small components. Let the child calm down. He will be crying. He'll be screaming at the top of the, sometimes they scream so loudly that I put some cotton ball in my ear because it is so shrill. But then that only that way, because if you are, if you are, if you are uncomfortable, you will not approach the child. So you first become yourself, you know, you should become comfortable. So I put some cotton balls in my ear. Then I slowly stand there. I show him my hands, see nothing. <laughs> I don't have any syringe or anything. So don't worry about it. And let the mother talk to the child or the father talk to the child. Again, the trick is don't get too many relatives inside the examination hall because if there are grandparents also, then somebody or the other is going to, you know, he's shifting from one lap to another and he's from uh, somebody's arms to other, then it becomes more difficult. So maybe one one parent or at the max two parents uh, inside. 
don't dim the light immediately darkness you know children are afraid of darkness so don't dim the light switch off the light completely to do retinoscopy you should have some light in the room don't wear a coat that is a given <coughs> don't touch the child for some time don't try to hold his head or something like do stay away you know he doesn't want you anywhere near him so let the child move around so he feels like running sometimes these adhd children are there autistic children are they very very restless so they will want to go around the room and touch things and pick up things and feel things let them do that for some time you know sometimes i mean your when a pediatric clinic is there we kind of keep it child proof so not many things in our clinic can be broken by a child <laughs> so our paint is child proof and our uh, toys are child proof and our uh, show pieces are also child proof so if they drop it and uh, there is no uh, no breakage or anything then pretend that you are examining the chi- uh, pa- child's parent you know you don't even talk to the child for some time when you pretend that you are looking at his eyes and all so he'll start looking at the mother or father or whatever and then slowly approach the child so your approach has to be very slow it's like you know going to close to diffuse a time bomb you know very very slow slowly you go with your <laughs> probe and the moment you feel some problem again take a step back and <coughs> you should show them things they would be attracted in promise them that you will give them that but don't give them immediately so it's like the carrot kind of a thing you should keep dangling one carrot after the other not give all the sweets at a time every time he cooperates give him some more incentive and if a child is sucking thumb or you know he is on a pacifier that is not the time to enforce discipline so let him suck his thumb or let him use the pacifier or his bottle or because parent will immediately keep taking out the thumb you know reflexly but that is not the time to teach him that some sucking is bad <laughs> whatever makes him cooperative that is fine ba- for the older children always they are very much interested in chips so give them a bag of chips the moment they are eating you know they need some distraction so it's like distract them all the time vision testing he is not going to read the chart to forget so you are just depending on whether the vision is equal or not and is there any reason for you to suspect that whether vision is bad or good cardiff acuity sometimes because it is done from a distance uh, then you might be able to do it if a child is home schooled for picture matching sometimes they might match a few pictures again few pictures not don't expect them to go all the way through 69 or 66 what you are interested in is their equality of vision or not and is there any unexplained inequality or not lot of encouragement will be required don't say things like no this is wrong or uh, don't shake your head in disappointment many times one of the parent is sitting and shaking his head in disappointment so you have to keep them and the child looks at him and then he just simply stops saying anything that's it that's the end of the examination because he wouldn't say anything unless he is assured of agreement from the parent and they keep the parent keeps doing this he doesn't want to say anything then you do a casual observation whether there is a squint on on cursory examination what do you see you see a child has got a squint or not whether he has got any abnormal posture of the head or not or whether he is making the you know some kind of chin depression or chin elevation or whether he is squinting his eyes <coughs> then you can shine a faint torch light the problem with torch light these days most of them are leds and they are very bright so if you shine a torch led torch in somebody's like eyes you know they go blind for few seconds i think i am out of time no i think it's i'll take a minute or two extra <coughs> yeah and so always if you have a led torch cover the torch with two three fingers and just lead, leave a bit, very little gap for the light to pass through always remember that because led torches you know it is like hitting the uh, you know car light it's like that it's that bad um then check the pupil again pupil checking is difficult in children because they'll keep looking at the light so you have to distract them show them some video at a far away you know place and then they can you can do check the pupil pupil will give you a lot of information when it comes to vision retinoscopy i showed you in the video how quickly i let them touch the lens so i give them the lens in their hand then they examine the lens then by the time they are examining the lens i pick up another lens and i do the retinoscopy then i give that lens again so every time it becomes an incentive every lens i pick up goes in the child's hand now the children know they are very bad at multitasking so you give them something in both hands suddenly when you give them the third thing they don't know what to do whether to drop this whether to take it that confusion is the time where you can do so many things so you have to confuse them 
it's like a magician tricking somebody you know you make them look at so many things and then you quickly slip in the trick you can do a quick cover test cover test will quickly tell you whether there is any small squint or whether there is inequality of inequality of vision and you can do a indirect ophthalmoscopy very well in small children even without dilatation if you are able to sufficiently distract them because if you leave that for post dilatation sometimes child will totally be so panicky after putting drops that that's the end of the examination so maximum amount of examination has to be finished before you put the drops now children are uh, this kind of instruments if you have in our clinic uh, in your clinic it is good because of this is a vision screener it is basically taking infrared photographs of the child's eye <coughs> and then that gives you so much information regarding refraction it will also give you some information regarding squint and pupillary size also so this can be done standing at 1 meter so if you have a pediatric clinic it is worth investing in a photo screener you can also do fields very quickly so if you show him one toy and you bring some another toy from the periphery and looks on that side you know that side field is reasonably good color vision is not possible to test in you know children who are very small maybe 1 or 2 years old but children who recognize shapes can be tested with color vision made easy kind of a chart which is available which has stars and circles and things like that intraocular pressure can be checked with eye care tonometer beautiful tool no need for drops just sufficient amount of distraction and you can quickly get one or two readings and most of the times it rules out any elevated iop and then you come to the dilatation most of the time you send them home ask them to dilate at home and come and never tell them that the drops will not stain because they will lose trust if you lie to them if you say no this is not going to sting and it stings he will not cooperate you tell them it will feel funny it will feel like sea water or something like that so then when it goes they are prepared for it and then they won't become uncooperative and will not lose faith now at the at the end of it there are still some children who are categorized as untestable so they are sometimes extremely aggressively behaving or things like that in such a thing change the entire thing change the setting so take him in the hall or check or sometimes send your optometrist to their home for checking change the person maybe he doesn't like you that's okay he doesn't like your beard he doesn't like your face he doesn't like your glasses maybe he is more cooperative with a female examiner many times i feel where i fail my optometrist succeeds so change the person and you can involve the caregiver they can do a cover test at home when he is watching tv and give you the information or make a video so many times i delegate that responsibility to the parent they can also come back with some pictures or something like that or you can reschedule the examination for another day the problem with rescheduling for another day is may, many patients are lost to follow up because parents feel this is going to get repeated so we will go when the child grows up and there are several instances where i have told them to come another day and they come after 5 years and they will tell you sir he was not cooperating so we thought we will bring him when he grows up so rescheduling on another day is not a good idea rescheduling on the same day is a better idea so you keep them waiting ask them to take a round and come back and try and do it like that observation sometimes i hide behind the uh, glass and see them in the waiting hall and that gives me lot of information i think i am exceeding time a lot i this is my last slide eua should be avoided if you are smart enough with your examination 99% eua can be avoided don't try to sedate the child in the opd never do that because you don't know his medical history many of them can go into respiratory distraction or apnea always do any kind of sedation thing wherever there is backup okay and many times just making the child hungry and then feeding the child and making him sleep is enough to get you enough information i think i'll leave the electrophysiology and this thing for the next speakers because they are going to cover in their talks thank you very much we'll take the questions in the end take out your pen drive
सूखा तो बस आज थोड़ा काटता है बस ये पूरा ही रहने ऐसे पेन ड्राइव क्यों रहने दीजिए कॉपी नहीं जाएगा नहीं नहीं कॉपी नहीं जाएगा Let's hope for the best. So, um, I'm Dr. Vashni Shankar, and I will be speaking. I'll be taking uh, from where Dr. Sudhar's finished. Basically, once we get the information, but we still feel that the examination is pretty much normal, but the child cannot see. So, what is happening? What are the most common conditions which we tend to miss? So usually a careful examination, if you're able to get the information, it gives us subtle clues as to what is happening. The, a child may have a subtle oculocutaneous albinism, a dilated, um, a good dilatation may show you a microsphere of achia. Most of the time there are subtle clues as to what is happening, what is the cause of decrease of vision. But today I'm essentially going to be speaking about a normal eye with or without nystagmus, generally covering CNS conditions including tumors, trauma, um, cortical visual loss, as well as hereditary fundus dystrophies. So when talking about hereditary diseases of the retina, the best thing is to ask a lot of questions regarding the family history, regarding the presentation, onset, whether the vision loss is progressing, whether it is worse during the day, whether it's worse during the night, and photophobia, like we see in this child who's hardly able to keep her eyes open, even for the camera, just to take the video. So severe photophobia is always a clue, and it makes us, uh, we can identify a category of the retinal disorder and then uh, proceed from there. So this was a 11 year old child who had been diagnosed elsewhere to have bilateral optic neuritis. She had been investigated extensively, already treated with IV steroids and referred because vision was not improving. So the first time I saw her vision was uh, 636 in both the eyes. Examination essentially normal, disc looking healthy, RNFL normal, VEP okay, maybe little low amplitude but essentially normal VEP but vision still what it was. We tapered and stopped the steroids, couldn't really explain the loss of vision, vaguely thinking whether it's functional loss of vision, but keeping under observation. So on one of the subsequent visits when repeating the OCT, I realized there was a loss of um, the ganglion cell complex, although the RNFL was normal. So which is when, when I looked at the uh, macula more closely, you can see there's that mild stippling. And um, I feel Stargardt's is one of the conditions which is missed so easily in the early stages because the um, retina looks nearly normal uh, by the time the vision decreases to maybe 636, 660. However, since we have the fundus autofluorescence photographs now available, it's much more easier to rule out and the appearance is really characteristic where it shows a, a characteristic absence of choroidal fluorescence or the silent choroid. Um, so this is another child, uh, two siblings presenting with profound um, a profoundly poor uh, vision since birth with this roving kind of nystagmus, poor fixation and high hyperopia. So this constellation of features, there is consanguinity in the parents, parents are cousins, two of the children out of four siblings are affected, very poor vision, poor fixation, roving nystagmus, high hyperopia. I don't think we need any further tests to be done in these patients because um, LCA is so diagnostic just by the constellation of features. Fundus generally is normal. This child showed some amount of uh, a bullseye maculopathy. The older one, the younger baby was completely normal, but this extinguished ERG, uh, unrecordable kind of ERG is characteristic of these patients. Um, LCA forms about 20% of children in schools for the blind and a detailed pediatric evaluation as well as renal evaluation need to be done for these children. Coming to uh, congenital stationary night blindness, the uh, term itself is very descriptive of how the patients present. Generally, these are older children. A lot of them may have 6'6 six, six to 6'9 six, vision, uh, complaining of severe difficulty in night vision. And uh, the patients who have uh, uh, CSNB, of course, is of two types with a normal fundus and abnormal fundus. The normal fundus looks completely normal. It's only on ERG that you can detect the characteristic negative waveform where the B wave is absent and the A wave is normal, which gives it that negative appearance. In the type 2, both A and B waves are reduced in the scotopic ERG. 
Um, in CSNP with an abnormal fundus, Oguchi's disease and fundus albi punctatus. I've put these photographs because um, they are not very abnormal. You need to know what that slight green sheen looks like in Oguchi's um, disease. And in albi punctatus, the, um, the spots are in the mid periphery, so not the posterior pole which we are used to looking at in smaller children. So the posterior pole is usually spared and you have these tiny flecks uh, reaching from the mid periphery to the periphery which needs to really be looked for. So this is another child, an eight year old with a, um, you know, multiple times visual acuity recorded at about 20 by 40 with this very subtle nystagmus which pretty much you can see on indirect ophthalmoscopy. But when you look at the um, retina carefully, you can see the blood vessels running across the FAZ, which gives us a clue to the um, diagnosis. So this is an isolated foveal hypoplasia, where the fovea is underdeveloped with absence of foveal pigmentation and FAZ and continuity of inner retinal layers. OCT is confirmatory, but it's very hard to do an OCT in these children because of the um, nystagmus. Generally, we are used to seeing foveal hypoplasia associated with aniridia or albinism. Um, so with that overview of hereditary fundus dystrophies, I want to move on to trauma. Trauma is an occasional cause of uh, cortical visual impairment, which can be transient or permanent. Transient CVI following an accidental trauma generally has an extremely good prognosis. But um, when we look at the constellation of features which are seen in shaken baby syndrome, which is a subdural hematoma of the brain, occult bone fractures and multiple retinal hemorrhages, then um, there's a very high probability that, a ch that this child uh, may have been abused. So when we see retinal hemorrhages in a young child less than three years old, we shouldn't be jumping to look at anemia and leukemia and so many other systemic features. Abuse really needs to be... Um, uh, you know, at the um, top of our differential diagnosis. This was a two-year-old child who came um, with history of being unable to see following a fall with trauma over the occipital region. The child appeared lethargic. There was no response to direct confrontation, menace reflex, or to optokinetic nystagmus testing. Dilated fundus, and in these young infants, a dilated retinal examination is essential. It showed a mild disc edema with a few dot and blot hemorrhages over the posterior um, pole. Um, the VEP showed the absence of any response, a diffusion weighted uh, MRI was completely normal. A skeletal survey and a complete pediatric evaluation was done and the patient was diagnosed to have a post-traumatic CVI. Patient was admitted and observed and started showing the response in visual acuity after about two days and was normal after three days. So in this case, I particularly wanted to present just to highlight that when you see retinal hemorrhages, then you really need to do a detailed systemic evaluation, especially looking for old healed fractures. The next patient is a seven-year-old girl who um, had a history of wearing spectacles, was patching the left eye four hours a day. So when I saw her on a preliminary basis, I thought this is a strabismic amblyopia in the right eye. There was a small RX3618 in the right eye, 69, already patching. So ordered a routine cyclorefraction and did a fundus evaluation. And when I saw the fundus, I thought that maybe there was a mild temporal pallor. But in a busy OPD, you know, sometimes you feel that you're seeing either a hyperemia or a pallor in every patient. And in a seven-year-old, no particular reason for that to be there. But um, just to be on the safer side, I did an OCT. OCT also was obviously this is false color coded. But um, there was an RNFL loss more in the right eye than the left eye. So I spoke to the parents and I said, I'm not very comfortable with the scenario, especially since this is the first visit. But I said, uh, you know, it might be better to do an imaging. At which point the parents come out with a history that they've been following elsewhere for the last one year and child has been on patching already. Vision has not improved. They've already been advised imaging. And they've just come for a, like a blind second opinion without any of the previous history. So we did the imaging and this patient had this huge cellar, supracellar um, lesion with solid and cystic components uh, compressing both the optic nerve as well as the chiasm. And um, I feel craniopharyngiomas in this age group, especially a younger age group, is very, very easy to miss unless you have a high index of um, suspicion. Um, the calcification is very easily visible on a CT scan and they are frequently misdiagnosed or the diagnosis is delayed. Um, 
ophthalmic complaints are seen in 96% of patients on presentation. Most of them have some level of optic atrophy either as a result of initial compression, surgical resection or radiation therapy. And finally, I'll be ending with uh, psychogenic or functional loss of vision. I personally feel that functional loss of vision is a diagnosis of exclusion and uh, we need to do a detailed evaluation of VEP and imaging before we uh, commit to a diagnosis of functional loss of vision. If the visual symptoms are long-standing, if they are progressive, if they are non-fluctuating, then that essentially over multiple visits that essentially rules out a functional uh, loss of vision because children are not capable of keeping up the malingering on a sustained uh, period of time. There are always, you know, all our usual tests which we do use a plano lens, chest for stereopsis, use red green uh, glasses. Those usually work in children and if they aren't, there's usually an organic pathology happening. So I will end with this 13 year old child who came complaining of multiple systemic complaints as well as ocular complaints. So there is headache, there's dizziness, there's blurring of vision, there's intermittent diplopia, there's uh, stomach pain, there's joint pain, features of UTI, gait instability. Parents had visited every specialist possible um, including a, and had every test done possible including MRIs, lumbar punctures, everything was completely normal. From an ocular point of um, view, the diagnosis was not difficult. The best corrected visual acuity was about um, 624. Patient had a bilateral uh, abduction limitation binocularly. Um, there was a esotropia, there was a variable pseudomyopia, which was uh, with a lead of accommodation on dynamic retinoscopy and uh, near normal uh, refraction on cycloplegic refraction. Um, but what was interesting in this child was the multiple systemic features. This is her on the second or third visit where she couldn't even walk, needed support even to take a few steps. Um, so um, diagnosed her with spasm of the near reflex and started her on treatment with atropine and bifocals and reassurance because she'd already been extensively investigated, everything was uh, normal. Uh, parents however were unwilling to believe that they went to a number of other specialists you know, went through a whole uh, gamut of tests for the child had IVMP, followed up with oral steroids, finally went to a psychologist, was started on antidepressants. It took a period of 18 months uh, when the child was on atropine for the spasm to be relieved and for all the systemic features to kind of just disappear. I've had her on follow-up for five years now subsequently and continues thriving absolutely, doing well at school, no subsequent relapses since then. So I would like to conclude by saying um, we can call it a functional um, vision loss only after ruling out all organic causes and um, a repeated follow-up when the diagnosis is uncertain is required because at some point we usually get a clue as to what is going on. Thank you. that the SRB's presentation also because it's on the same pen drive and then we'll get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, due to an emergency, Dr. Shikha Basi was supposed to be doing one of the, no, 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 we call it open call. Yeah, open call. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, that's what in this patient, you know, I wasn't thinking in those terms at all. Just because of the pallor, just ordered an RNFL. I wasn't thinking in terms of craniopharyngioma, honestly, b when ordering the imaging at all in this patient. Child was already dilated. 
um, so therefore I couldn't do a, I've seen her on a single visit pretty much um, so uh, Dr. Shikha Basi is the deputy director of neuro-ophthalmology at Shankanetrale and she was supposed to be doing this talk on the mystery of the pale disc However, due to a family emergency, she couldn't be here. So I'm just um, reading her presentation and I'll try to do my best with it. So congenital disc anomalies uh, may have an abnormal um, appearance pertaining to the size, shape, contour or color of the optic disc. This may or may not have a visual impact which may be abnormal, subnormal or normal. And systemically, it may be associated with other congenital systemic abnormalities. So common congenital uh, disc anomalies which we are used to seeing are the coloboma of the optic disc. This may be inherited sporadically or autosomal um, dominant inheritance. Uh, may be associated with the Pax2 uh, gene mutations. The coloboma occupies the lower part of the optic nerve head and the neuroretinal rim is absent inferiorly but usually identifiable superiorly. And vision may be impaired depending on the foveal involvement. So an OCT shows generally this deep excavation um, of the optic disc and complications which may be present include peripapillary choroidal neovascularization as well as retinal detachment especially in those also associated with an optic pit. Uh, systemic associations as we know usually um, most commonly is the charge syndrome which includes the coloboma, coronal atresia, congenital heart disease and multiple other abnormalities. Coming to the morning glory syndrome, this shows a conical excavation of the posterior fundus including the optic disc and is filled with glial tissue and it's usually unilateral. Um, so in this um, OCT we can see that a neurosensory detachment can be noted at and surrounding the disc and at the macula. A subretinal precipitates, ERM and ILM wrinkling and RPE alterations are noted. And uh, subretinal moderate reflective echoes and cystic spaces can be seen surrounding the disc. And here we can see the glial tissue, the tuft of glial tissue at the center. So ophthalmic uh, findings which distinguish morning glory disc from optic disc uh, coloboma um, include in morning glory uh, disc anomalies, the optic disc lies within the excavation. Whereas in optic disc coloboma, the excavation lies within the optic disc. Uh, in morning glory, usually there's a symmetrical defect where the disc lies centrally. Whereas in an optic disc coloboma, there's an asymmetrical defect with the excavation lying inferiorly within the disc and there's no central glial tuft. Uh, severe peripapillary pigmentary disturbances can be present in a morning glory anomaly whereas, whereas there are minimal disturbances in a coloboma. And the retinal vasculature usually has this uh, spoke wheel pattern in a morning glory whereas the vas vasculature is normal in case of a coloboma. Coming to uh, optic nerve hypoplasia, this is one of the leading cause of blindness in children. There's an axonal loss due to apoptosis during development. Um, retinal and CNS ganglion cell failure may result from events occurring very early in the gestational life, which may include fetal alcohol syndrome and um, maternal diabetes. The blood vessel pattern can be normal. There can be this kind of uh, tortuous uh, blood vessel pattern or they can be uncommonly straight. The uncommonly straight kind of pattern may be associated with the endocrine abnormalities also commonly uh, seen associated with optic nerve hypoplasias. The, um, disc to, um, the disc diameter to disc to macular ratio is quite enlarged in these patients which is diagnostic. One of the common systemic uh, features which are associated is septo-optic dysplasia or demorsia syndrome which includes optic nerve hypoplasia, pituitary gland hypoplasia as well as midna midline abnormalities of the brain. And uh, going with that, corpus callosum hypoplasia is the most prevalent neuroimaging abnormality which is associated with optic nerve hypoplasia. 84% of the cases are bilateral. Nystagmus develops within three months, which shows the early uh, visual impairment followed by strabismus in the first year. Um, coming to optic nerve head drusens, usually this kind of um, superficial drusens are not visible in young children, but it's a common cause of pseudopapilledema in young children. Um, when the drusens are superficial, the disc may appear pale due to loss of RNFL. Children most often have buried drusens. And um, these um, peripapillary ovoid uh, mass lesions are more often associated with pseudopapilledema as can be seen over here in children rather than optic nerve head drusen where the lesion is much more clear cut with superficial um, hyperreflective surface. Coming to Leber's hereditary optic atrophy, 
um as we know there's a maternal transmission of the disease the peak age of onset is 15 to 30 years and men are affected much more commonly than uh, women who are generally carriers three point mutations in the mitochondrial dna uh, cause 90 to 95% of cases of lhon they are located at the mitochondrial dna positions 11778 3460 and 14484 with uh, 11778 being the most common and also having the worst prognosis for vision um this incomplete penetrance is seen in most of the patients with only 50% of males and 10% of females uh, harboring a pathogenic uh, mitochondrial dna mutation actually developing the optic neuropathy and uh, there is a maternal inheritance because it's a mitochondrial mutation females will transmit the pathogenic mutation to all their children and males do not transfer the mutation um so in clinical pr uh, presentation asymptomatic lhon carriers may have telangiectatic uh, uh, vessels around the optic disc uh, with central visual field defects symptomatic cases generally there's a subacute onset one eye uh, followed by the other eye characterized by painless loss of central vision um vision usually f uh, ultimately 660 or worse although over a period of months to years there is a gradual improvement in some patients the mr imaging is usually normal in the acute phase coming to autosomal dominant optic atrophy it's uh, it's generally a mild visual loss relatively there's an insidious visual loss typically starting during the first decade of life which generally tends to remain stable it's believed to be the most common of the hereditary optic neuropathies usual onset is in the first decade of life and the gene responsible most commonly is the opa1 gene and the product of the opa1 gene is crucial for stabilization of the mitochondrial membrane integrity uh, visual acuity is usually reduced to the same mild extent in both the eyes it remains between 2020 and 20 by 60 throughout life and visual fields may show a central paracentral or secocentral scotomas and the optic atrophy uh, may be subtle or may just have a mild temporal pallor spontaneous recovery of vision does not happen coming to the wolfram syndrome or more commonly known as the didmore syndrome um this juvenile onset diabetes mellitus diabetes insipidus optic nerve atrophy hearing loss and neurodegeneration um the gene most um, responsible has been designated as the wfs1 um characterized by as mentioned diabetes insipidus diabetes mellitus optic atrophy and um, deafness Uh, most patients die prematurely with severe in, in approximately the third decade with severe neurological disabilities most likely due to respiratory failure and finally autosomal recessive optic um, atrophy is characterized in early uh, childhood it's associated with variable pyramidal tract lesions um, signs uh, ataxia mental retardation urinary incontinence and pes cavus and um, it's relatively rare Visual loss usually manifests before the age of 10 years, is moderate to severe, and is frequently un, uh, accompanied by nystagmus. Neuroimaging may demonstrate diffuse symmetric white matter abnormalities. Thank you. So I'd now like to invite Dr. Jyoti Matalia. Dr. Jyoti is the head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuroophthalmology at Narayan Netralaya, and she'll be speaking to us about the sw swollen optic disc in children.
Yeah, so good morning all. I'd like to thank Varshini for organizing this uh, wonderful IC and inviting me as well. So what I'm going to talk about is swollen disc in children, evaluation and management. Let's start with the case. A routine checkup child reported to us. Now carefully look at the discs. When you see it is the elevation is confined to the disc, the disc vasculature is visible at the margins, no venous congestion, sharp peripapillary nerve fiber layer reflex, crescentric circumpapillary light reflex, and no exudates. So this is a pseudopapilledema. Then when you see a patient like this, get a good B scan done, which show calcific deposits, showing high spike on A scan, a confirmation on CT scan, telling you that this is a distrusin. In addition, a fundus autofluorescence will also show this calcific, and as she described, this is a buried disc drusen. Sometimes you find those white particles outside, which is a uh, thing which has come out. So when you have something like a disc edema, you need to classify it into asymptomatic, which is a pseudo disc, uh, pseudo papilledema as shown, or a symptomatic, which is seen here, where there's either a reduced vision, pain on eye movements, reduced color vision, headache, transient visual obscuration, which will give us a differential diagnosis of optic neuritis, papilledema, systemic or neurological diseases. So let's then understand what is true disc edema. When the elevation exceeds into the peripapillary retina, there's graying and mudding of the peripapillary nerve fiber layer and obscuration of the vessel just at the margin, you know that's a true disc edema. So then let's look at this case, bilateral disc edema. Both eyes had 6 by 18 vision with pain on movement. Three days later, the vision improved to 6 by 6, had received vaccination 15 days prior. This is a classical bilateral optic neuritis. And look at the history, vision loss, came back to normal and had vaccination. This is what is classical in children, which is different from adults, where it is painless, bilateral and anterior. It's associated with infection or post-infectious and unassociated with multiple sclerosis. What are the other features? Retroocular pain, severe loss of vision, even lack of light perception can be there. A classical relative afferent pupillary defect if it's in one eye. Less contrast sensitivity, that's the earliest sign to get affected. Then brightness sensitivity is affected and color vision defects, which are basically washing out of your colors. Your red colors become less red and that's important. So how do you find, uh, classify them? One is infectious or uh, non-infectious. In infection, we're looking at rubella, measles, multiple of these infections as mentioned, toxo, TB, and vaccination, which is live attenuated. This is classically said that if you have a post-infectious optic neuritis, it may be a harbinger of MS in children. The other are non-infectious, Basically, multiple sclerosis, ADEM, and Devic's disease. These are pediatric optic neuritis associated with neurological sign. So how do you investigate? A baseline MRI of brain with and without contrast. And without, with contrast is mandatory to pick up any en uh, enhancing lesions. If scan is normal, sequential follow-up is needed. But if scan is abnormal, as you can see, two or more typical white matters offer treatment with IVMP. And if you have this classical presentation, we are thinking of MS. You may also now do aquaporin for antibodies and anti-mog antibodies for specific condition, which I'll talk subsequently, and other ancillary tests. Remember, LP has no role in this unless, in case of an isolated, unless you're trying to classify the presence of MS by looking at uh, oligoclonal antibody. This is a classical, uh, classical cl uh, criteria for MS. Role of steroids, no control trials for children, as per whatever is an ONTT, but you can give IV medial prednisolone as mentioned. Maximum dose should be one gram per day, followed by a slow taper. Remember to maintain the taper very slow to avoid relapse. CNS inv involvement may require IV, IG, and plasma exchange. And this is the treatment for pediatric MS. But I usually co uh, collaborate with my uh, pediatric neurologist for treatment. As mentioned, the other types of demyelinating, which are now more commonly seen, the NMO and the MOG IgG associated or disorder. Uh, as you can see, um, neuromyelitis optica is a bilateral, simultaneous, and sequential condition where there is aquaporin Ig antibody as a main marker, needs IV corticosteroids, and rituximab, has poor recovery. On the other hand, MOG IgG, which is more common in children than in adults, is what we initially thought as Creon, has MOG IgG cell-based as a positive and needs treatment with IV uh, corticosteroids, having excellent recovery. Now let's look at this case, a case with bilateral isotopia with bilateral six nerve paresis. We are looking at the disc, which is very important. Never miss your disc when you're doing a strabismus examination. This patient had early papilledema. It was a basically a six-year-old with headache and vomiting, 
refer to rule of papilledema. Vision, as you see, is not affected. Color vision is normal, unlike what we saw in a patient with optic neuritis. So this is early papilledema. So carefully notice your discs when you have a patient presenting with esotropia. These are established papilledema as it sets in, eventually chronicity, and finally atrophic. In atrophic, you'll see pallor completely come in and disc flatter. But that doesn't tell you that it's improving. In fact, it tells you that the vision is eventually going to go away and the child is going to be blind. So the failing discs are what appears when they start flattening. So we have to look for causes of in, uh, elevated intracranial pressure, which could be intracranial mass, obstructed cranial venous flow, decreased CSF outflow, that is pseudotumor cerebri syndromes, and excessive CSF production. Symptoms are headache, transient visual obscuration, very, very important, you can ask, but sometimes difficult to elicit in children, nausea, vomiting, diplopia. So how would you investigate? Classically vision, color vision, and visual field where you have an enlarged blind spot, an inferior nasal step, which you can do only in older children, eventually constriction, and then the central field is lost. But what are the issues with the young children? Symptoms are unreliable. They may not complain of loss of vision and fields, uncooperative chi uh, child, difficulty in doing an examination like vision, color vision, fundus, not able to do any of the OPD tests like visual fields. Sometimes they don't even have papilledema, infants with open fentanyl. So how do you confirm that your disc edema has anything to do or what the diagnosis is? For that, what I recommend is a B scan for optic nerve head size in SAF, where if you do a B scan of the cross section of the nerve, what you'll see is this crescentric uh, black hypoechoic crescent, which is classically with a diameter of more than four. So here it's 6.5, indicating that this patient has papilledema. In fact, it is this SAF around the nerve that helps you differentiate it from pseudopapilledema and bilateral optic neuritis. And why do you see the SAF? Because you know clinically that once the CSF is formed in the lateral ventricle, goes to the third ventricle, then the fourth ventricle, it goes into the SAF space. And this SAF space, as you can see, is right around your optic nerve. And this is what you actually detect when you are doing your B scan. So the diagnosis or the cause for your papilledema is picked up by looking at this SAF. Then you need to get an MRI done to rule out the mass, because that could be one cause, and ventricular involvement in or of hydrocephalus, which is commoner in children, as you can see here. MRV for venous thrombosis, and finally LP for opening pressure. So here we do LP for detecting the opening pressure. We also do the analysis, but usually it is normal. Now when the L opening pressure is more than 250 of, uh, that is borderline, but definitive is more than 280 millimeters of water, you confirm that the patient basically has a pediatric IIH, and now I will talk to you about what will be the possible medical and surgical management of the same. But before that, let's understand why is IIH so important. Because it's a direct association with visual loss. It can call, cause irreversible loss of visual function, that is acuity and loss, in as high as 40% of children. And it can be the only serious complication which can occur early and late. And unfortunately, in children, we may not detect it till the child goes completely blind. Because as the vision starts coming down, they start adapting. And they will be comfortable because they'll not be able to explain. So this is important. So how do you manage it medically or surgically? In medical, weight loss for obese children. Diet is low sodium, corticosteroids in inflammatory conditions, and acetosamide or furosemide to be given with serial lumbar punctures. This is done twice weekly, but not very suitable in, court in children. Sometimes they spontaneously also resolve, but you need to monitor this. Now, uh, we have done, uh, we've published a paper where we've shown this monitoring treatment only on the basis of B-scan, where the patient was started on treatment, and as you can see, the B-scan showing the SAF resolved in three weeks of treatment. So here we cannot repeatedly do an MRI to see if there is a fluid behind it's gone or not, but this will tell you. Yes, by the time the papilledema resolves, it's fine, but sometimes papilledema takes longer time to resolve. The fluid behind has disappeared. You know that the condition has resolved. So we basically have about 52 cases that we have been done with my pediatric, uh, pediatric neurologist from MSH Bangalore in Narayana Hill City. We start with 25 milligram per kg per day, increase up to 40 milligram, monitor electrolytes, usually have got no side effect except for paresthesias. Topiramate should be added in teenage, adolescent girls. Advise weight loss, very important, and that is more common in those which are in, uh, the, which are in puberty, closer to that, and need a consultation with dietitian. And we had one LP done so far in fulminant IIH in 17-year-old and one optic nerve sheet decompression in a child. That brings us to the question, what is a surgical intervention? 20% need it, as mentioned, LP shunt or VP shunt. And ONSG has to be reserved for those where we are expecting visual loss and we are knowing the child is going blind. CVT is kept for in conditions of those anticoagulants are given. An intracranial tumor, surgical removal is a must. But you need to monitor the pure, uh, optic nerve 
saying that the papilledema should flatten after this treatment. So how do you do it? Uh, do an OVNSD, do a 270 degrees peritomy, hook the medial rectus muscle, uh, pass sutures through it, you disinsert it and take the baseball stitch, as you can see, then turn the globe laterally, and here, this is the medial transconjunctival approach, where you see the optic nerve sheath there, you take a direct nick into it, you'll see the gush of fluid. After that, there's a decompression, then take a part of it out, like a small window, put in a blunt instrument, try to break the connection so that the nerve, because there, if these are in chronic cases, they're multiply loculated. This is then followed by closure, middle rectus muscle is put back. And a patient who has an optic uh, disc edema like this can get complete resolution by four months in something like this. So what is the best treatment in IIH? We can see that in for resolution of vision, optic nerve sheet gives about 67%. But there is no perfect, perfect treatment because no trials have been done and no treatment guidelines. So we may need a subsequent retrospective study to diagnose the same. And then coming to the other causes of disc edema, neurological, you could have hydrocephalus, neurofibromatosis, spinal cord tumors, or subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. In systemic, we are looking at any of these, like for example, infiltrative like leukemia or lymphoma. You need to have a very good history taken prior to this or somebody who's on follow-up needs an immediate treatment with oncologist or shaken uh, baby syndrome as Dr. Varshini mentioned, especially in history in, of trauma to see and then you may see these classical rot spots which are typical of uh, uh, this kind of injury. So to basically summarize, when you have a patient with optic disc edema, Find out whether it's true uh, edema or, or pseudo disc edema. Once you've ruled out pseudo disc edema, for true disc edema, important to like check, look for vision loss. If there is vision loss, yes, papillitis is what you look for and go ahead and evaluate. But if there is no papillitis and there is no loss of vision, then you have to do an MRI scan to rule out structural and non structural cases. In no structural cause, get a lumbar puncture done and the opening pressure to be checked to confirm a pseudo uh, trauma, sorry, pseudo tumor cerebri. And if there's a structural disease and presence of high lumbar puncture, we are diagnosing as papilledema, we'll need a neurosurgical intervention. But if the lumbar puncture is normal, then we have to look at other causes. So three important P's that you have to note, pseudoedema, rule out, unnecessary investigation to be avoided, papillitis, you need to treat it differently, and papilledema to, disc, uh, to treat along with, basically you'll need a neuro pediatric neurologist to go ahead and treat your conditions. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Rishikesh Mai. Um, he is at Avdut Netralay Nagpur, and he's very active in most of the pediatric ophthal and squint activities indoors in AIOS and SPOTSI. And he's going to be speaking about divergent directions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Varshini, for uh, making me a part of this uh, uh, co instruction course on uh, pediatric uh, neuroophthalmology. So uh, the topic is quite extensive. I have got 10 minutes. I will try to just uh, briefly mention it into three parts. That is the cranial nerve palsy, the gaze palsy, and myasthenia gravis. Coming to the cranial nerve palsy, uh, this kind of picture you must have seen many a times in your OPD. 16-year-old uh, male who has a uh, motility problem and ptosis uh, uh, in the left eye since early childhood. Uh, it, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is basically a case of a third nerve palsy, which is usually congenital. So congenital third nerve palsy is quite common. Uh, but as Dr. Siddharth had mentioned during his presentation, the child might be qu uh, quite uncooperative. This was an extremely uncooperative child. Uh, but you can see that he has got uh, exotropia uh, in the right eye, which can still give you a clue that uh, probably uh, the patient might have a uh, third nerve palsy. You have to investigate and uh, go in details. Uh, 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 not every time the third nerve palsy uh, eye will be, uh, I mean, deviating. Sometimes it might be a fixing eye because uh, in uh, it might be the better seeing eye. Like in this case, it was the right eye with uh, ptosis and uh, ocular motility limitation in the right eye, whereas the left eye was normal. But because the right eye was uh, better seeing, the patient used uh, that for fixation. So the deviation which you get is secondary deviation. So just measure the primary and secondary deviation all the time in order to know which eye is the paretic eye. I'm showing it in adult because in child it might be a bit uh, difficult at times. So 
uh, it was the right eye and uh, with uh, right eye fixation what you get is the secondary deviation now i'm use uh, increasing it uh, to uh, neutralize the uh, exotropia with the prisms uh, the, the eye in front of the prism is the uh, i mean the non fixing eye or the non dominant eye so uh, secondary deviation is more than the primary deviation in cases of uh, uh, paratic squid uh, the uh, uh, third nerve nucleus originates in the midbrain and it passes in close proximity to the red nucleus and the corticospinal tract. Everybody must have read this in literature about the different kinds of syndromes which might be associated. Not very common in children though. Uh, what is uh, commoner in children is the aberrant regeneration. I, this is the right eye as you can see the patient uh, uh, ocular motility uh, and the ptosis. The ptosis is in uh, more than on attempted abduction but on attempted adduction the ptosis disappears. This is a pseudo uh, I mean reverse Duane syndrome uh, which you get as aberrant regeneration of the third nerve. So uh, many a times in congenital you may not be able to find the exact location but sometimes it might be posterior communicating artery aneurysm in these cases. So uh, the third nerve also passes through cavernous sinus like all the other cranial nerves and involvement of more than one nerve uh, may be seen if cavernous sinus is involved. Uh, usually third nerve in children is incompletely, uh, it's an incomplete condition and the most common muscle involved is the inferior rectus. So looking at the right eye of this patient, you can see that uh, the uh, superior rectus is overacting and uh, inferior rectus, that is the uh, depression in abduction is li uh, limited and this indicates that the inferior rectus is underacting. So sometimes the patient may be saying some vague uh, ocular movement because he is not aware what exactly is happening. But uh, an inferior rectus is usually uh, commonly involved in congenital third nerve palsy. Uh, there are two uh, types of third nerve that is medical and surgical. Medical is more common in adults. Uh, surgical might be there in children and in addition to the ocular motility limitation involvement of uh, pupil might be there. Involvement of uh, it might be incomplete uh, third nerve palsy, uh, multiple cranial nerve involvement and aberrant regeneration might be seen. Uh, when to image in third nerve palsy, I actually image all my patients of third nerve palsy irrespective of what the cause is. But usually it has been recommended in literature that uh, children less than 10 years or involvement of pupilar, uh, pupil, uh, history of trauma, multiple cranial nerve palsy and aberrant regenerations you need to image. Uh, this is the haze chart which you see the uh, field with the, uh, this the smaller field belongs to the paratic eye. Usually it is a lateral rectus and in inferior oblique, uh, sorry superior oblique which are working in these cases. According to literature the congenital third nerve palsy is mostly in complete uh, uh, radio imaging might show hypoplasia or aplasia of the third nerve in only 30 percent of cases. Uh, the most common muscle involved is inferior rectus then comes the medial rectus. Now coming to the fourth nerve when the right eye uh, when the left eye goes up in right gaze and the right eye goes up in left gaze think always in terms of bilateral superior oblique, oblique palsy which is most common type of a uh, 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 fourth nerve palsy. Uh, congenital fourth nerve palsy. Uh, you can see that the patient also has a superior uh, oblique, uh, inferior oblique overaction in the right eye and superior oblique underaction. Uh, checking the ocular movement in children might be difficult at times, needs a lot of cooperation and uh, you need to spend at least first five minutes uh, getting accustomed or the child accustomed to your environment but uh, it is rewarding at times. So you can see that uh, the in superior oblique in the right eye, uh, in the left eye is also underacting. Uh, this nerve is slightly different because it originates at midbrain. It decussates at the level of the superior colliculus, uh, sorry, inferior colliculus, and then leaves the mid no, midbrain or uh, brainstem ventr uh, dorsally, and then comes uh, has a longer intracranial course. So the uh, area at the decussation might get affected during forceps delivery. So if you see a case of fourth nerve palsy, always ask for a forceps delivery history of forceps delivery. Uh, there might be involvement of uh, cavernous sinus, uh, I mean fourth nerve at the level of cavernous sinus orbit or you can have a isolated fourth nerve palsy. So remember that in fourth nerve palsy, the left eye goes up in right gaze and the right eye goes up in the left gaze uh, and patient will have a V pattern which is typical of a bilateral superior oblique palsy. Depending upon, I mean for unilateral uh, superior oblique palsy, the patient will have head tilt in order to compensate for the excyclotorsion. Uh, depending upon the excyclotorsion, the head tilt might be there. In acquired cases, like in trauma, the patient will not have a significant superior oblique underaction. Uh, he, he will have more of an inferior oblique overaction. Uh, always, I mean you can do a uh, three-step test, park Belchowski three-step test, or simply by tilting the head also you might be able to know whether uh, it is oblique palsy or not. Like in this case, now you can see that the hypertropia is increasing on attempted right head tilt and disappears on left head tilt. So this is a right superior oblique palsy. Uh, double Maddox rod will rule out, uh, help in ruling out a bilateral superior oblique palsy. Uh, more than 17 to 20 degrees of uh, 
uh, excitotorsion indicates a bilateral superior oblique palsy. Haze charting uh, will show uh, inferior oblique overaction in addition to a superior oblique underaction in these cases. Uh, sixth nerve palsy in children uh, in uh, more common is trauma. Like in this case, he had a uh, uh, iron gate fell on his head and it, he had a facial nerve palsy in the left eye and abduction limitation in the right eye, uh, which can be confirmed by, uh, I mean, uh, doing a uh, cover uncover test the secondary deviation when the right eye is fixing is more than the primary deviation when left eye is fixing so uh, fourth nerve also might be involved with all the structures uh, as we had mentioned previously and his charting will help in confirming the diagnosis it will have a medial rectus over action in the uh, on the side which is affected some statistics uh, most common congenital oculomotor palsy is third nerve followed by fourth nerve and uh, the third and fourth nerve are usually congenital sixth nerve otherwise is more commonly uh, because of trauma and second is ih as uh, dr jyoti had already mentioned uh, the among all these nerves fourth nerve is the most commonly managed conservatively that is without surgery and radio imaging is more likely to be positive more uh, I mean multiple cranial nerves are involved uh, I'll just mention one case as far as the gaze palsy is concerned a 15 year old female uh, with history of sudden onset diplopia in the right gaze and difficulty in reading in uh, uh, I mean uh, since one week uh, she had a normal left gaze and uh, on attempted right gaze you can see that uh, there is adduction limitation in the left eye uh, and she had a bit of a uh, uh, nystagmus kind of movement in the right eye on attempted right gaze. Uh, she also had convergence uh, loss and because of which she had difficulty in reading. Uh, she was a case of left sided in internuclear ophthalmoplasia. Uh, in this age, demyelination is more common. So you MRI we should actually think in terms of uh, um, uh, peri demyelination changes at the periaqueductal um, area. Uh, which is very well revealed in flare sequences. So when uh, the left, uh, here two structures are important, the medial longitudinal fasciculus and PPRF. So if left sided MLF is gone, the patient will have a, lef a normal left gaze, uh, whereas on attempted right gaze, like the patient which I just mentioned, there will be, uh, I mean, limitation of adduction in the left eye and nystagmus, uh, ataxic nystagmus in the right eye. If in addition to MLF, the PR PPRF is also gone, then in a uh, patient will have a INO as well as loss of left gaze, so which is called one and half syndrome. One and half syndrome is comparatively rare compared to internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Uh, the last part of my presentation is pediatric ocular myasthenia. Uh, all of you are aware that ocular myasthenia is because of loss of acetylcholine receptors because of autoimmune reaction. In children, it is 15 to 20 percent more common. Uh, I mean, 15 to 20 percent of all the cases uh, in myasthenia are in pediatric age group. It is not as rare as we, we might think it is. And ocular involvement is there in 15 to 35 percent of cases based upon the literature which you follow. Uh, ophthalmoplegia and ptosis are the more common features, but uh, it is a master mimicker. It can mimic any of the ocral, uh, cranial nerve palsy. Diurnal variation may not be present in all the cases. But this is a typical case who had uh, ptosis and ophthalmoplegia, which recovers with the ice pack and uh, tensilon which you used to use previously is not available nowadays so you can use a neostigmine you can see that on injecting 0.5 ml of neostigmine 15 minutes after intravenous injection there is improvement not only in ptosis but also in ophthalmoplasia in these cases so very typical of uh, uh, pediatric ocular myasthenia uh, you can do additional investigations of electromyography or serological test which is positive in 85 percent of cases with acetylcholine receptor antibody now always do a chest ct scan to rule out thymoma because removal of thymoma might, might cause regression in these cases and they are more common in children uh, just one two minutes uh, one minute uh, py uh, the among the treatment part, pyridostigmine and oral steroids are more commonly used and I think uh, they cause regression in almost most of the cases of pediatric ocular myasthenia. Only thing is you have to titrate the dose depending upon the response which you get the patient. So there is no fixed rule that this dose has to be given and accordingly. Uh, this is a child who responded completely with this kind of treatment uh, with pyridostigmine and oral steroid. If they, uh, I mean, uh, patient is not responding after six months of starting the treatment, you can resort to using immunosuppressives, most commonly used is azathioprine. Palliative treatment like uh, uh, prisms for diplopia or crutch glasses for uh, uh, ptosis can be used. Ptosis correction has been done, uh, has been done by a few uh, clinicians, but better to avoid it as much as possible because of poor bends. We conducted a study of six patients uh, over three years in our uh, center and we found uh, that uh, uh, pediatric ocular myasthenia is uh, show presents with variable degrees of ptosis and ophthalmoplegia. We respond very well to pyridostigmine and oral steroids. I gave oral steroid in all the cases. And early medical treatment helps in remission, avoids recurrence and helps in avoiding generalization of ocular myasthenia in children. I take this opportunity to invite you for the midterm conference of uh, SPOSI, which is scheduled on 19th of June, uh, I mean just another 15 days from now in Nagpur. Thank you.
speaker is Dr. Swati. She is an assistant professor of ophthalmology at RP Center. And she will be speaking about nystagmus. A very good morning to all of you. And thank you, Dr. Avashni, for making me a part of this wonderful IC. And today I will be talking about nystagmus in children. Okay. Right. So I'll be talking about nystagmus in children. So before it's not moving. No, it's not moving. Slides are not moving. Yeah. So all kinds of movement that you see in, in a child or even in an adult are not nystagmus. You have to learn to differentiate the nystagmus from an imitator, which may be a nystagmoid movement or a saccadic or disorder or a bobbing. So that's the first question one needs to answer. The another question is if it all, if it, it is a nystagmus, whether it's a physiological nystagmus or a pathological nystagmus, because physiological nystagmus generally does not need any kind of investigation. Then if it is pathological, what is the cause? So with these three questions in mind, we'll, uh, I'll take you through this presentation. We'll try and answer how we can approach a case of nystagmus. So all ocular oscillation, as I said, are not nystagmus. So is it a nystagmus? So you have to see because nystagmus is a regular rhythmic repetitive oscillation. So all, every single word is important. It's a regular. So the movement has to be regular in a particular direction. It has to be a, there has to be a rhythm and it has to be repetitive. Initiated by a slow eye movement with a fast corrective component, right? So once we have, uh, so this is just to show that how th this is a case of pendular nystagmus where you can see that the eyes are moving in a particular rhythm and repetitively moving. So coming to the characteristic of nystagmus, so nystagmus can be pendular or jerky as we had seen in that case. Then it can be, uh, it has to be classified according to the fast phase. So the direction is given according to the fast phase of the nystagmus. It can be horizontal, vertical or torsional. Classified as small, moderate and large depending on the amplitude and again depending on the frequency, it can be classified as slow, medium or fast. If the amount of movement, if the amplitude frequency is same in both, it's known as conjugated. If it's different, it is known as disconjugate nystagmus. So it has to be differentiated from the nystagmoid movement, which are not regular or, and are neither rhythmic. Oculopalatal myoclonus, opsoclonus, ocular um, bobbing, and human bilchowski phenomena are example of such uh, nystagmoid movements. So once you have established that this is a case of nystagmus, you have to know whether this is physiological or pathological. So there are physiological nystagmus in form of endpoint or end gaze nystagmus, vestibular nystagmus, optokinetic nystagmus, and voluntary. There are certain characteristic of these physical nystagmus. They are present only in extreme gazes, as in gaze, uh, end gaze nystagmus. Their, their trajectory is generally horizontal. They are they do not sustain for a long time and usually last for three to four beats. They are low amplitude in nature and generally are symmetric in amplitude and waveform and no other neurological or any other systemic issues are seen. Vis-a-vis -vis a pathological nystagmus, which does not meet all these criteria of physiological nystagmus, is classified as pathological nystagmus. And even though the exact mechanism of or the pathophysiology of this nystagmus is yet to be established, we know that's generally because of the three basic mechanism. One could be because of the vision loss, which is secondary to the local ocular causes or a vestibular dysfunction or a neural uh, in integrator dysfunction, which may lead to motor nystagmus. So once you have established that this is a pathological nystagmus, you want to know, is it an acquired pathological nystagmus or a congenital pathological nystagmus? Because an acquired pathological nystagmus needs extensive neuroimaging or neurological workup. So how do you differentiate between a congenital and an acquired case? So the congenital case is generally earlier in onset, less than six months, and an acquired usually 
later. Vision is generally reduced in a case of congenital nystagmus vis a vis an acquired nystagmus where vision is generally well maintained unless there is some intracranial pathology that can along the visual pathway. The null zone is generally seen in congenital nystagmus while you know have no null zone in an acquired nystagmus. Ocelopsia is a common complaint in an acquired nystagmus. Latent component is absent in an acquired nystagmus and there will be associated neurological signs and symptoms. So these are the, th this is the list of pathological nystagmus. You are, so more commonly is what we see in children is congenital nystagmus, which is in form of infantile nystagmus syndrome or a fusional maldevelopmental syndrome. These are two most common kind of nystagmus what we usually see in children. So I'll be talking to, uh, talking uh, about each one of them. So coming to infantile nystagmus syndrome, it's a primary cause could be an ocular pathology which may lead to the various degree of visual impairment or a primary neurological cause that may or may not be associated with an ocular pathology or it may be a simply idiopathic isolated INS. The, the features of uh, INS include it's of generally bino binocular and conjugate in nature. It's uniplanar, no oscillopsia, abolishes in sleep and improves with convergence and increased fixation effort and distinct waveform is seen in slow ascending phase. It, it may or may not have eccentric null gaze. The null may be there in primary gaze or maybe in dextro or levoversion. So this, this table similarly shows that how an INS can present. So it can present as an idiopathic nystagmus where there is some family history and uh, it's, as I said, conjugate and horizontal. Then it can be associated with oculocutaneous albinism. It can be a, a PAX a gene disorder or part of an achromatopsia. So this video just shows a case of uh, um, nystagmus, infantile nystagmus syndrome, which is in seen in a case of oculocutaneous syndrome. Now you can see that the patient has the null zone in the dextro version, and after the beyond the null zone, the direction of the nystagmus changes. Similarly, in another case of uh, nystagmus, uh, infantile nystagmus syndrome, where you have eccentric null zone. And the null zone changes once the, uh, sorry, and the direction changes once the uh, target is, uh, has gone beyond the null zone. So another variant of the nystagmus, uh, infantile nystagmus syndrome is nystagmus blockage syndrome where the amount of nystagmus is inversely proportionate to the amount of esotropia. So more a patient tries to fix the intensity of the nystagmus comes down, but the amount of esotropia increases. The another variant could be congenital periodic alternating nystagmus. The next uh, part, a kind of uh, nystagmus is fusional maldevelopment syndrome, which has a manifest as well as latent component. It is also conjugate horizontally and, uh, and uh, horizontally horizontal nystagmus. The important characteristic is that it worsens on covering. So whenever one occlude the one eye, the nystagmus worsens and also changes its direction. So the, the direction of fast phase is always towards the fixing eye. And once the uh, occlusion is changed to the other eye, the, there is change in direction of the uh, nystagmus, fast phase of nystagmus. It's commonly associated with uh, disease like infantile esotropia and DVT, also known as Chianza syndrome. Binocular vision is usually better in these cases than unocular lesion and generally does not need any neuroimaging. So this is a classical case of uh, fusional maldevelopment syndrome. You can see when the patient is trying to fix with the left eye, his, his uh, direction or uh, head posture has changed. So initially he has a right dominant. Now uh, when you cover the left eye, the patient tries to fix with the right eye and his head posture changes again. The another type of nystagmus seen in children is spasmus mutans, which is a triad of nystagmus, torticollis, and head bobbing. And uh, uh, the onset uh, of spasmus mutans is infantile. This kind of nystagmus is pendular, horizontal, disconjugate, asymmetric, low uh, amplitude, and high frequency. And also increases on uh, convergence vis a vis other types of nystagmus, which generally dampens on convergence. That is, it, it may have a self-resolution by age of 2 to 8 years. If not associated with any sensory data, um, deficit, may have strabismus. 
although rarely it may be associated with optic nerve uh, or chiasmal gliomas. Gazivoke nystagmus is the most common type of acquired nystagmus which is seen in cerebral lesion or drug toxicity is generally evoked on lateral gaze but is absent in primary position and it beats in the direction of gaze. Vestibular nystagmus can be central or so peripheral. Depending, out of yeah, time. I just have few more slides, so I'll skip. So as I uh, as I said, the approach includes detailed family history, detailed ocular examination, detailed examination of anterior and posterior segment to rule out any ocular pathologies that may cause nystagmus. OCT may be needed if there is no obvious fundus abnormalities. Subtle abnormalities can be picked up on OCT or maybe on electrophysiology as was discussed earlier. Neuroimaging, so these, this is, these are red flags when you want to do neuroimaging in the case of uh, nystagmus. So late onset oscillopsia, vertical with torsional component, disconjugate. So this, how you work up a case of nystagmus, you can do nystagmography or nowadays even video nystagmography is uh, available. Most of the time, this uh, non-surgical management is in the form of best refractive correction and adaptation with either prisms or, you know, medical treatment can be done in cases of acquired plant. Surgical management is done only in cases where you have a def definite head posture with an eccentric null position. You want to shift the head posture. So depending whether it's an INS or FMNS, you want to do the surgery accordingly. So in a case of INS, you want to do a shift of the null position. Uh, by doing a, an Anderson procedure, pro, uh, procedure, which is the most common type of procedure that we do uh, in our center. In, in a case of, uh, this is also a case of INS, in a case of uh, fusional maldevelopment type of nystagmus, you want to do a bilateral medial rectus recession with posterior fixation because you want to induce artificial divergence. So as I said, you have to have a very clear cut uh, thing about nystagmus, whether it's actually a nystagmus it's physiological pathological congenital or required and do and you know take up your approach accordingly thank you thank you Dr. Uh, our last speaker is dr sovita she is a consultant in pediatric ophthalmology and neuro ophthalmology at dr shroff charity eye hospital delhi and she's going to be speaking about syndromes with neuro ophthalmic manifestations in children Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Vashni for involving me in this IC. So as most of it is covered, I would just touch upon some rare syndromes which we encounter in our daily practice. So this was a two and a half years old female who presented to us with lid edema. And on careful examination, we could see it was a soft swelling over the upper lid with corneal haze. And also, also on systemic evaluation, there were some hypopigmented patches on the trunk. They carried some old reports which they were elsewhere diagnosed with congenital glaucoma, ectropia and UVA, and the MRI orbit showing bophthalmos and proptosis. No doubt with the constellation of all these signs, we would think that this is a case of neurofibromatosis, which was further confirmed on our genetic evaluation. So neurofibromatosis be belongs to a group of phacomatosis, which are actually heterogeneous group of multisystem disorders, and that share a predisposition to develop hematomas within the CNS, often in association with cutaneous ocular or visceral lesions. The other entities under this group are NF2, Sturge Weber, tuberous sclerosis. So basically they are actually due to a disturbance in neural crest migration where NF1 is commoner than NF2 and the mutation is in gene chromosomes uh, located at chromosome 17 and chromosome 22. The ocular features which we would see in these cases apart from the systemic ones like cephalot spots, freckles which are some hyperpigmented 
Uh, in wrist patches are the areas of friction and there would be cutaneous neurofibromas. The plexiform neurofibroma of the upper lid giving a lazy S deformity, leash nodules which are avascular clump over the off tissue over the iris and the optic nerve gliomas, sphenoid wing dysplasias causing temporal part pro pro prolapse and a fullness of the temporal fossa and this unidentified bright objects which are hyperintense lesion along the brain but they do not have any clinical significance. So these are the other manifestations which are seen and reported in various cases like hypertelorism, proptosis, corneal edema, bufthalmus with or without increase in pressure, ectropia and UVA, retinal hemangiomas and vascular occlusion, choroidal neuromas, disc edema and all this leading to amblyopia in association with strabismus. So bilateral optic gliomas are present which would cause disc edema. They were seen as tubular swellings in, uh, in the T2 section without, they do not, the optic nerve sheet does not run parallel. However, it is a fusiform swelling and there can also be multiple focal hyperintense lesions in the brain. If a disc edema is present in presence of proptosis, it gives us a clue that it is an optic disc glioma. However, if it is without proptosis, this could be secondary to hydrocephalus or a chiasmal glioma or hydrocephalus associated with aqueductal stenosis. Finally, they would lead to optic atrophy at the primary or secondary. If these gliomas are present an along the other uh, cranial nerves, then they would cause cranial neuropathies, headaches, and additional neurological symptoms. In 40% of the cases, they would have intellectual impairment, learning disability and hyperactivity. In NF2, ocular features are less, but what are the ocular features? A posterior subcapsular cataract or cortical opacity and they would present with lesion resembling epiretinal membrane with macular pucker or combined hematomas of the retinal pigment epithelium. They would present with papilledema in the present because if there is presence of optic nerve meningioma, which would present as disc edema. The classical appearance of optic nerve meningioma is the visual tram track sign where they run parallel the optic nerve sheath is parallel unlike the fusiform swelling of the optic nerve glioma. So this was another three years old male who presented to us with, with some with the on his mother's lap with subnormal intelligence, the uh, pigmented lesion over the face and one can see the cataract as well as corneal edema there. A detailed evaluation of genetics shows that this child had Sturge Weber syndrome. So these are sporadic congenital neurocutaneous syndrome with a triad of facial birthmark or port wine stain, abnormal blood vessels and eye abnormalities like glaucoma. The treatment of this is depending upon the symptoms which are available. The neuroophthalmic manifestations here would they would have cortical calcifications which would result in seizures and in T1 weighted scans they would have leptomeningeal vascular mal malformations and mild cerebral hemiatrophy. So they would present with homonymous hemianopia from occipital lobe involvement or glaucomatous optic atrophy and strabismus and an isometropic amblyopia. This is tuberous sclerosis. Touching upon its ocular manifestation, the most common is retinal astrocytoma. If it, uh, it mainly involves retinal nerve fiber layer, when present closer to the disc, it would mimic as if it's a disc drusen and would cause pseudoedema appearance. Apart from this, they have a constellation of systemic features and they can also be retinal achromatic patch. This was another two years old male who presented to us with his parents and we see there are a number of features here. They, on examination, he had central steady and maintained fixation, but poor attention span. What we see in these pictures as is, is a prominent forehead with bony irregularity, chin down with left head tilt, marked proptosis, down slanting of palpebral fissures, and cleft palate, dental anomaly, syndactyly, ectropion with lower lid laxity, phonics prolapse with chemosis and exposure keratopathy both eyes, left exotropia, no excyclotoshin on fundus, and no evidence of disc pallor. All this gamut of symptoms as the signs which we see here, and a diagnosis brought us to think that it is Appert syndrome. So Appert syndrome belongs to craniosynostosis where we have premature fusion of one or multiple of these uh, sutures. Once they are prematurely fused, they would inhibit skull growth perpendicular to the fused suture and there would be a compensatory growth parallel to the suture. When these, the most common uh, suture which has premature fusion is sagittal, giving us a boat shaped head or if it is unilateral it will give us a plagiocephaly, anterior plagiocephaly or a, tri a trigonocephaly 
when the triangular skull shape with prominent vertical forehead ridge if the metopic suture fuses early. So what are the syndromes associated with these premature fusion? The most common which we encounter are Crozen's, Peffer's and Appert's and all of them would present with exorbitism, hypertelorism and down slanting palpebral fissures in association with mid-phase mid hypoplasia and because of these uh, orbital anomalies as well as uh, skeletal anomalies in these cases they would always have excessive perspiration and respiratory difficulties. So the ocular sequelae here are strabismus, a V pattern, which is called as ex cyclotorsional strabismus. Refractive error, most common is astigmatism. They would also have legophthalmus, as we saw, leading to exposure keratopathy and corneal scar. Finally, all these would have predisposition to amblyopia. So glasses and patching therapy, most of these kids would remove the patch because of the excessive sweating. When to do a strabismus surgery is a debate after the complete bony growth beyond two years or early than that so excessive lubricants and lateral tarsography is also done disc edema can be seen due to abnormal cranial shape or volume ultimately leading to optic atrophy and vision loss and the intracranial pressure measurement can be done with various methods as discussed and emergency treatment in this condition is done when there is an elevated ICP this was another six years old female who presented to us with reduced distance vision. On careful examination, there was compound myopic astigmatism, vision was 6-9, and both eyes had mild subluxation. As we saw, there was no wrist sign, thumb sign, pest planus, but there was increased arm span to height ratio. The, she was uh, accompanied by her mother who had history of lens subluxation as well. She was tall and lean and also carried a cardiac evaluation uh, paper which showed that there was dilated aortic root. So in presence of ectopia lentis, superotemporal, increased arm span and aortic root dilatation with the presence of a family history, we are sure it is nothing else than Marfan syndrome. So this is the most common syndrome associated with ectopia lentis and located, it is an autosomal dominant with fibrillin 1 gene mutation. These are the ocular and abnormalities in and syndrome which involves all of our uh, structures and uh, systemic uh, manifestations as well. So cardinal Dr. features Sovita, is you need to supratemporal incidence is 60 to 80 percent with multiple uh, with blood vision, monocular diplopia, posterior dislocation and irregular astigmatism. With this we need to differentiate them from the mass phenotype which is myopia, mitral valve prolapse, aortic root dilatation, skin and structural abnormalities as well as the contractural syndrome and from homocystinuria which would have an inferior dislocation in presence of mental retardation and will march sunny where there would be microspherophakia, ectopia lentis, brachydactyly and thickened skin. So all of these would then also have ocular complications like corneal endothelial damage, decompensation, pupillary block glaucoma, subluxated lens, dislocated lens, and also retinal detachment. Therefore, to conclude, in all these con uh, conditions, a meticulous history, both of ocular and systemic, a detailed preoperative evaluation about the bony abnormalities, timely intervention to prevent, to have prevent amlapia, and definitely a multidisciplinary team approach, but the care does not end without an optimal post-op treatment and rehabilitation, thereby giving a good life and a perfect visual outcome. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. It was a lovely IC, although marred by a lot of AV um, issues. Uh, so we apologize for the delay, but it was mainly because of connectivity issues. <laughs>